Welcome into Clipboard Conversations. I'm John Fokey. So happy to be joined by Nate Mitchell, Hornets assistant coach. And Nate, uh, obviously, as we continue to navigate these uh, unique times and, and kind of this unique situation, how have you been spending your time? What's, uh, what's been keeping you occupied? Um, been doing a little bit of working out, um, trying to stay on top of that. Um, been trying some, some new recipes here and there that I probably wouldn't have tried in the past. Um, so yeah, I think cooking a little bit more, working out a little bit more, um, um, probably doing, also doing more things outside, obviously, cause all the gyms are closed down, but, uh, that's pretty much it. Netflix, the regular stuff. So you say you've been cooking. You've obviously, I, I imagine you've seen cooking with JB, the segment that we're doing, uh, on Hornet okay. social media channels. Uh, what are some of the recipes that JB shared some of his, he had, I think he had like uh, he had tacos one night. He did salsa the other night. Oh, yeah. What are some of the things that are happening in Nate Mitchell's kitchen? Uh, I, I I've been I grew up in a Jamaican household, so everything has been for me like I I wanted to kind of pass it down if I ever get a chance. So I feel like I've um, tried the, the curry chicken. I feel I tried the the oxtail. That one eh, didn't really. Work. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of traditional Jamaican dishes that um, I always wanted to do, um, still not adding them to my mom's, but probably the best one I did was the jerk, uh, Jamaican jerk wings. All right. I, you know, I think we need to get you with JB you guys trade some recipes because uh, <laughs> that sounds good. The oxtail is a tough one. I, we had a great Jamaican place back in Minneapolis that, that did it right and did it yeah. well. But boy, if you don't do it well. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the way I, it was like a slow cook too thing. So it was like three, four hours. Um, try to figure it out, man. But uh, you got to you definitely have to have a nice little touch on it. Netflix. Uh, is it Money Heist? That seems to be the one that's going around right now. Uh, I, I finished Money Heist maybe two days. Um, Ozarks finished that pretty fast. Um, and then just trying to catch up on some, some old stuff. Uh, the Pablo Escobar, the Narcos, like all that stuff. I, I think it's really, really interesting. Um, just to try and figure out what's really going on on, you know, the other side of the world, I guess. Um, but those things, to me, are really interesting just to see how things were orchestrated. Um, but, and some of those, too, so, it's like yeah. you, you really need to pay attention. Uh, and I feel like this is a good time, especially with Narcos, where you can, like, really settle in and, and pay attention to what's happening because you're probably not so distracted with everything else that's going on. Yeah, I mean, like, even, even the ones with, like, El Chapo is, like, I – I never knew about this, and this was going on up until like maybe three, four years ago. Until you start reading into it, um, you hear about the cases in New York, and um, so like to me that was interesting because I think he, you know, El Chavo just, you know, was going through a whole sentencing thing up until a year or two ago, uh, which is extremely recent. So um, those things, just to, you know, sometimes we go through life and you, and you don't really recognize what's going on, but it's going on. How about uh, reading? We talked to Dutch a couple of weeks ago, and Dutch had a bunch of books that he was reading. He said Ronald has been recommending some books for guys. You, yeah, uh, you've been reading any at all? I, I haven't. There, there is um, one book that a psychologist, um, when I was working with the Team Canada, that he got to me that I actually wanted to start reading. Um, I didn't get to it as yet, but it was on my list because I was knocking out all these Netflix stuff. Um, but I definitely, I, I told him I was going to get to, and I have to, um, and it was about charisma. So I, I definitely need to try to get that. And I think it's just cool about people commanding a room, um, and be able to do those things. I think those things are really important. All right. We're going to follow up a little book report in a couple of weeks. Once, once sure. we get through all the Netflix shows. Yeah. We'll follow one up. more show and then I'm done. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you brought up team Canada cause I want to transition to basketball and your role with Team Canada and your role with the Hornets as well. But what did it mean for you to represent Team Canada in the way that you have? And what did you learn from your experiences there? Man, honestly, it, it was an honor um, just to be able to get in, um, you know, four years ago. Jay Triano actually 
um, gave me an opportunity when he was on board. Um, and I feel like uh, since then I've forever in debt just for the opportunities to represent my country. Um, I didn't get to do it playing um, and, and now get to do it coaching um, and, and helping all the young guys come through the system. Um, it's been an amazing experience. The World Championships last summer was an amazing experience. I've never been a part of something like that, um, you know, which was on a road to Tokyo this summer, which we're all looking forward to. Um, obviously, it's, it's been postponed till next summer. Um, but again, man, it, it's a different brand of basketball, FIBA style of basketball. Um, but it, it's helped me because it's so many, it's so many games. The games play differently, and um, everybody around the world is doing something um, different than you can all take from. And some of those games I've gone back and watched, um, and I knew some of the things that I took away from this summer with the World Championships, I brought to the Hornets and, and you know, as some ideas, like, hey, coach, look at this. I saw these things being done. I think it could help our team because it's similar. Um, and JB, you know, you know, it's up to the head coach, you know, what he can use, and he thought some of them were great. So I think those experiences are, are, are amazing anytime you get to – um, do international play. And, and as coaches with Team Canada are, are learning from other countries, coaches with Team USA are learning from other countries, sure. other countries are learning from Team USA, from Team Canada, does right. it feel like international basketball, even though, as you mentioned, the FIBA game is played differently, but it, does it feel like there are some similarities between teams now? Yeah, I, th I think there's more similarities. And I, I think what you're seeing is the influx of um, European coaches coming over. And, and giving their, their thoughts. Um, so the coaches are coming over, but for years, players were coming over, right? For years, now the international game is so heavy to the point where, you know, the NBA has now changed that rookie. Um, it's like international, right? The world team and the USA team. Um, mm -hmm. But if you look at the, the USA team and the world team, it's, it's equal. Um, you know, Luka Doncic is a star in his own, the Porzingis, all the guys from Canada. You know, our country has 13 NBA players now, um, which is, I think, the most out of any international country in the NBA. Um, France is up there, and then you have all these other countries coming. Uh, Serbia, obviously, really, really good. Um, but I just think that there's so many things happening that are transferring now because of the players and the coaching styles um, that are now into the NBA. And, and so you're seeing more of the international game, the, the switching of defenses, um, the movement um, pre pick and roll, I would say. Um, and I think it's really helping the game. It's a lot more free flowing and it helps with the rules. Um, I think the biggest thing is them being able to stay in the paint over there. So they need to figure out how to create space um, and movement while you're able to stay a little bit stagnant defensively uh, we're in the U.S., you cannot stay in the paint as much. So if you can add that same type of movement along uh, with the rule changes that we have in the U.S. with the NBA game, I think, I think it can be really hard to guard, um, along with obviously having some players. But, like, it's, it's, it's interesting to see um, is how it's going. Yeah, it's fun to think about even more player movement, which could result in even more ball movement, which means that ball's going side to side and yeah. everybody's involved and the defense is going to have to constantly be thinking. For sure, for sure. I mean, you think, you're talking about pace. Uh, the pace of the game is, is, is at, a, at a – it's just nonstop. Um, we were watching uh, the Denver Nuggets series um, from a couple of years ago with Carmelo Anthony um, and – they were ranked number one in their pace. And I think they would have been ranked in the bottom five of today's NBA game. And it's like, it's like, man, it's crazy. In 2000, in 2000, the NBA average was 13.3 threes per game, right? This year was 33, the average per team. So like, it's a, it's just a different game. The, the amount of, the amount of possessions has increased right, which is allowing obviously more threes, but the pace of the game is just a lot more. And when we talk about pace, it's not just running up and down, as you talked about. There could be pace within a half-court setting as well. Yeah. And one of the things that you guys, the Hornets, pride yourselves on is moving the basketball and passes uh, per possession. I guess why is that so important to have that pace when you are in half-court in addition to having the pace just getting up and down the floor? 
Well, I think the biggest thing is 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 like what we talked about even in the FIBA game is getting the move, the defense to move, right? The hardest thing to play against, um, whether you're playing internationally or in the NBA, is a set defense. So the amount of passes that you can use before an attack, before a, a paint threat, a paint touch, um, where we get to shrink the defense is, is extremely important because you need to create some advantage and closeouts so that guys can really, um, you know, penetrate and get into the paint. Um, so the amount of passes that you have to do sometimes and maybe three, four, and the movement to, you know, create an advantage where then you need a read from a player. And then the read usually helps create uh, shorter closeouts into longer closeouts. And that's where you get um, the better offensive possessions within the NBA. Man, it's fun talking basketball again. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I feel like I love it's it. been so long. We haven't, we haven't been able to talk hoops in so long. Um, one thing I found fascinating as we traveled around the league this year was any player, it seems like, that had any sort of connection to uh, basketball in Canada, you knew and you had a personal relationship with. Uh, how have you been able to make so many connections and, and be such an integral part of uh, Canada basketball, not just on the national team scale, but really just, you know, at the grassroots level as well? I mean, I, I, I came up like that. Um, I mean, I, I started uh, training youth in the, in the gym in the inner city in Toronto. Um, so the amount of kids that came through just for me to work with, um, astronomical. And then it, I obviously I got lucky with some players to be really, really good. Um, actually, an old friend of mine, like Denim Brown, uh, who played at UConn, I think got drafted by Seattle, which is now OKC at the time. And he was still playing professional basketball. And he came in the gym and saw me working and wanted to work with me. Um, and, and actually that's where it kind of took off. Like I, I, I worked with him and it, it, and it trickled down to guys like Jermaine Anderson and Javon Shepard, who were all like senior men's national team players, um, which only, um, you know, the coaches started to notice that, um, there was some guy, um, working with these guys, especially during the lockout, the lockout season. Um, so that actually helped a little bit, but, from then on, just being attached to, you know, players, um, helping them grow, help, you know, being invested in them um, with sweat equity and, and allowing them to get better um, has trickled down into the youth. Um, I've also been a part of the training center. Um, we have a national training center in Toronto. Um, and so coming up, up through development with 905, uh, Raptors 905, um, while being involved with Canada basketball, I mean, we've had high-level athletes come through there that have been able to help and um, give them little nuggets to get better. So some of them just ended up being in the NBA today. Um, you know, I think we had four kids in the first round from Canada last, last year, um, which is great. But it's just it, – it's, it's ever coming. It keeps on coming, um, the amount of kids. And from what I hear from back in Toronto is just that there's just more people – um, even more young guys coming. Um, and you see these at, like, the little NBA basketball without borders. Um, and you see them in college. And so it's good to see for the country. It means that we're, we're still growing. Um, we're getting better. Um, and, and we're just trying to catch up to the big, the big bro USA. And you talk about that development. Uh, you were part of the Raptors 905. You were part of uh, Boston Celtics G League, the, uh, the main Red Claws. Um, as, as you went through those experiences in the G League, what are some of the things that you learned about how important the G League is to the parent company and, and what a role it can play in developing guys uh, that could eventually, like we saw in Toronto, be a big part of an NBA championship team? Yeah, uh, man, that, that's huge. Um, be able to transfer a system down, uh, down to the G League team um, and get guys to play a role and understand their role on how it's going to be transferable to the NBA is, is a big piece. Um, also knowing what they're capable of doing, um, enhancing those skills, as well as the things that they're um, struggling at, at the moment and trying to touch on those things. Um, year by year, try to add something new. Uh, uh, what are the things that are going to be able to help you make an impact right away in the next two months, three months, um, have these type of plans ready for these players. 
Um, and that's been the biggest thing. And I think it's been able to help a lot of the young guys throughout my journey. Um, um, it's been able to help a lot of the guys here in Charlotte. Um, and anywhere I can to help if I have any experience in the area, I, I love to give that and just to keep growing myself because I still, I mean, I still go down there and watch games. Um, I just think it, it's fun to see like guys really develop and move on. Um, that's like probably the best part to see guys have success at the NBA level. And some of those guys with Toronto, you think of Pascal Siakam, who was down uh, with Raptors 905. You had Fred Van Vliet down there. Um, so you got to work with those guys and then see them develop into the players that they became. Here in Charlotte, you work with Devontae Graham. I know you work with uh, P.J. Washington quite a bit. Do you see similarities, and, and not necessarily in the game, but sort of in the mindset, the approach, of some of the guys that you work with in Charlotte versus some of the guys that you've worked with in the past that have gone on uh, to big NBA careers? I do. I do. I, I do. I see a lot of similarities. And, and the biggest thing for them is understanding, you know, what you're going down there for. Because I, I, I have seen the guys on possibly opposing teams when I was coaching in the G League, you know, take that time to be like, all right, here's a chance for me to get mine and prove what I can do. When it's like, no, you need to go down there and, and improve the things that you need to get better at. And, and those are the most um, – that's probably the best advice that you can give any of those guys that are going down there. Um, even this year, watching um, Caleb Martin and Cody Martin go down there and get – and obviously Jalen as well, go down there and get time and get better. I remember going down and watching Caleb, the way how the game slowed down for him. He was playmaking. He was making shots. Um, and I think those things were so transferable to when he came up with us at the end of the season. Um, and as the game slows down, because a lot of guys that come from college to the NBA, is the, like we talked about, the pace, the pace of the game, the amount of possessions in the game, um, um, and the spacing, it's different. So um, to be able to help those guys and understand what they can do right away in terms of what the head coach wants is probably more important um, and those guys have done that. And obviously, you know, Devontae, Dwayne Bacon, they, they've done that. Um, um, PJ, he was able to have the opportunity right away and didn't go down there. Um, but even at the beginning of the season, we were talking about, hey, if you have to go down here, this is what we're going to do. Like, I've seen it happen. This is what you can do. Um, but if you stay up with us, then here. But he just ended up having <laughs> a really good start to the season where he didn't have to go. So that was great. Um, but the G League is one of the best tools, man, to learn. Trial and error is the best way, to be honest. Um, and there's not a lot of pressure. Where do you come up with some of these drills and, and little workouts that you put guys through? Because I watch you sometimes, and it's, it's never the same thing twice. It's, it's constantly stressing the mind and the body. Where do you come up with these? Um, to be honest, I, I surprise myself. Um... I, I'm, I'm, I'm big on transferable things uh, when we're on the court and we're doing things with players. Um, I try to come up with analogies all the time um, to kind of get, you know, the player thinking in the mindset of what I'm trying to envision for them to do. And so sometimes if there's a specific things I saw that night or the night before, like we try to um, – I try to sit down and be like, okay, I saw this on film with PJ. You know, defensively, he's doing this, or offensively, he's doing this. How do we get better with this? Um, if we need to improve arc, what is something that we can do? Um, and so, like, I think there's a part of innovation that helps um, guys stay focused. Um, I don't think you can reinvent the wheel by any means because um, you have to have your fundamentals. You have to have your basics. Um, but that – part of the drill making is, is pretty much everything a player can need just to stay engaged over a long season. I think you have to, you have to be creative and that's why you have to be dialed in and think of these things or else, you know, they can kind of veer off. Um, so, I mean, that, that's probably been the biggest thing, just trying to, trying to be innovative as much as possible, but you have to make sure you're hitting the fundamentals um, in the same manner. When you were working with Biz, did you ever really think you were going to see him rip off the Euro step in live game action? <laughs> oh my! Listen, I remember. I remember that game. Um, 
<laughs> I remember the game. He was in transition, and he was dribbling the ball. And uh, Coach Dutch, Coach Gately was beside me. And I grabbed him. I said, oh, no. And he, he dribbles it, and he hits the guy with a Euro step. He finishes and one. He holds his hand up, and, and Dutch is hitting me in my chest. <laughs> I was just like. I was like, yeah, yeah, we worked on it a hundred times and it happened once. That, that's an amazing feeling. Um, it was two points. Um, but I think, like, sometimes like that, like, like as a coach, man, if you, you think you can, like, teach somebody something or, or make them believe that this is possible, um, you know, that it is transferable, I think, I think those are like, man, I, was, I helped two points tonight. Uh, as an assistant coach, you know, if you give a suggestion to your head coach and your head coach says, all right, we'll try this. And it happens to be two points, like out of 110 points in a game, like you, you got to beat your chest um, as much as you got to take fault if, you know, something's going on and it's not working. Right. It's like this guy hasn't made a shot in a while. The question is going to come, Hey, what are you doing to make sure this is happening? So, um, you got to take the bitter with the sweet for sure um, and, and keep working. And like I said, you know, innovating. That was a great, that was a great moment. <laughs> we'll wrap up with this. Uh, the final couple of games, and I know we've had JB on and, and we've talked about this quite a bit, but uh, where you guys were at over the final eight games, offensively and defensively, but more specifically the final two and, and how much fun, even though, you know, that setback at Atlanta, but seeing, Terry go for 40, seeing Caleb Martin uh, go for 23, Devontae for 27. I mean, uh, the full team effort there. And then what the team was able to do in Miami. How encouraged are you coming out of those two games and, and really the month of March up until the season was suspended? Yeah, I think, I think, it's, I think it shows growth. Um, it, it, there, that is a time that you can look back at and say, okay, here's how good we are when we were doing this. How can we continue to do this over time? Um, I think it's the youth that we have um, and the development of the young guys, all the coaches are putting so much work um, to try and help these guys get better, whether it's in the G League, um, the player development coaches, um, the assistant coaches. And, and, you know, JB has set that as a parameter. That is something we have to do. We have to get these young guys better. And I think to start to see that on the court, um, with some gratification, and for sure, I, I, I look forward to more. Um, and I feel like in the future, um, we expect more from these guys. Um, but it's kind of just, at least we're laying down the blueprint, which means if, you know, if we get more young guys in the future, we kind of know, you know, what it took. This, this is what Devontae went through. This is what PJ went through. This is what Caleb and Cody went through. Um, and you're able to compare you know, these development stages of all these guys, and hopefully you can continue this going forth into the future. So um, I expect nothing for it not to stop and continue and the guys get better. Yeah, it was certainly fun to see the foundation laid uh, through the, the beginning part of this season. Nate, we thank you so much for taking some time. Continue to stay healthy, continue to stay safe, and uh, we'll be looking forward to that book report coming up in a couple of weeks. Gotcha. Nate Mitchell joining us on this week's episode of Clipboard Conversations. 